So Anne, do you want to um, kick it off? Thank you very much, Louise, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us, particularly those of you for whom it's a very uncivilised time of day. The beauty of uh, no video is that those of you still in your pyjamas, it's fine. Um, I'm uh, Anne Fry, an independent consultant specialising in the mobility needs of people with disabilities. I'm currently working with Louise and her colleagues on the High Volume Transport Programme to focus on the disability issues and what they mean. Um, I'm going to be moderating today's session, trying to keep order, but also trying to get a good focus on the discussion so we can draw some good lessons from it. Um, so just a reminder, please, to keep your microphones muted when you're not speaking um, and keep your video cameras off uh, so we can facilitate it as well as we can for people literally all over the world. Um, I think we're spanning from Mexico to Shanghai and all points in between. So I will hand over now to Louise, who will give us some of the background to the session and we'll then move into the speakers. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Anne. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Louise Cathro. I'm the Programme Manager for the High Volume Transport Programme, or HVT, as you will hear us refer to. Um, HVT is a uh, five-year um, applied Research Programme, which is funded by the UK Department for International Development. Um, and the focus is on national and regional transport corridors within cities and low-income countries in Africa and South Asia. Um, so the High Volume Transport Programme is pleased to present this first webinar, which features our Inclusive Access Network. Um, this inclusive access network originates from the panel members that participated in the foresight session on disability inclusive public transport um, that was held at the PIOC World Road Congress in October 2019. Uh, this session was um, organised um, by the HVT programme on behalf of the um, UK Departments of Transport and International Development. Um, and for those who are not uh, possibly aware, the session, uh, the foresight session on disability inclusive um, road transport was awarded the best session of the Congress as voted for by the delegates. So the network members are all experts in the field of inclusive mobility and social inclusion and originate from a wide variety of organisations, including multilateral agencies, academia and civil society. Um, and as Anne mentioned, we've got um, members that vary um, from countries as far afield as China um, and Mexico. Um, specifically, um, the members of the team or, or the members of the network include Charlotte McLean and Farpo from the World Bank, Danielle Abbas from UNDESA, Mohammed Youssef from the US Federal Highways Administration and also the founder of the Equally Able Foundation, Mary Kress from the Paris based International Transport Forum. Professor Pan Heshio from Tonji University in Shanghai, Saeed Mohammed from the Islamic Development Bank, Amin Amir Andani uh, from the NGO Now PDP based in Pakistan, Amanda Gibbard from the Department of Transport in South Africa, Professor Nick Tyler from um, UCL, Subesh Vashit from the Savayam Global Center for Inclusive Environment in India. Frederick Msigala from the Com Comprehensive Community-Based Rehabilitation Center in Tanzania. Janet Jimenez Santos from Canla, a consultancy based in Mexico. And uh, Claire Smith from Transport Scotland. So we hope that everybody enjoys this webinar today. We're very interested to hear the perspectives from our speakers and also the thoughts of our audience as we seek to capture ideas, gaps or initiatives that can benefit our low income beneficiaries or spark off new research under the HVT program. Um, the duration of the webinar is 90 minutes. We want to avoid overrunning unless of course the conversation is really interesting. Um, but we will try to um, answer as many questions as we can during the um, during the, the webinar. Um, and alternatively, we may need to pick up some of the residual questions as part of the, um, the wrap up and the information that we send out to the attendees um, uh, at the end. Um, so um, great stuff. Thanks, everybody. Um, and I'll hand back to Anne. Thank you very much, Louise. I hope everybody is uh, is hearing and participating fully. Um, I, we're just going to start now with a contribution from Bernard Avika from uh, 
the HVT programme, and Bernard is going to give us a little bit of context about the work and how this particular topic fits with it. Over to you, Bernard. Thank you very much, Anne, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Bernardo because Anne said I'm the team leader for the HVT program. Um, inclusion, inclusion is one of two main pillars for the HVT program. It's high in the priority ranking for HVT. So over the past year, we've supported DFID's efforts in this area through a number of initiatives, as well as hosting a number of conference sessions, including the foresight session in Abu Dhabi, which you've have, you heard Louise mention. We've published an inclusive, inclusive access booklet for people with disability, a document intended for policymakers. We will shortly be revising the Road Note 21, a document that helps technical experts design, design transport infrastructure that is inclusive. We've also called for proposals for research suppliers to provide us with innovative research projects that can improve the inclusivity of transport systems in the global south. We have several other inclusive access initiatives in addition to making sure that inclusion is very much a part of what we do in our everyday research activities. So as COVID-19 pand pandemic takes hold in low-income countries with transport systems being in the primary mode of infection, we need to understand the impact on the most vulnerable and people with disabilities in particular. What are the inclusion less issues and lessons? And who is addressing those issues now and in the post-COVID-19 era? In the past few days, we've published a short paper calling for a coordinated action by global transport sector key stakeholders on COVID-19. This publication is based on the findings of work we've been doing over the past few weeks to establish exactly who is doing what in the transport sector in response to the pandemic. The study, sadly, shows that no one is paying particular attention to inclusive access, despite the many important issues which the pandemic raises for inclusion. So I would therefore like to think that this webinar is a small start in an important gap which we need to fill. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Bernard. I think that gives us a very clear context and sets out the importance of what we're hoping to start in motion today. And obviously what we do today will, I hope, be the beginning of a, a lot more focus and movement in this particular area. Um, I'd like now briefly to call on uh, Penny Innes, who is from DFID, the Department for International Development in the UK. Uh, Penny is the head of the disability inclusion team at DFID and will just give us a brief update on the work uh, that she has been doing. Penny. Thank you very much um, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning everybody. Um, it's great actually to have an opportunity to join you today and to hear about the, high, the work of the high volume transport programme. Um, and, and the issues that have been set out. I thought I would just give you a little bit of background on what um, the Department for International Development in the UK is doing um, in, in terms of its COVID response, and then also say a, a little bit about what we've, what we've um, already been hearing about the impact on um, people with disabilities. So, so my whole organisation has, has kind of shifted over the last few weeks and um, entirely really focusing on the COVID response. And um, up to date, we have um, committed to funding £744 million to the COVID response, but we're also redirecting many of our um, other programmes um, to support um, the, the response and the pandemic um, working with international partners including the UN um, to make sure that the, the, the support reaches the people uh, most affected um, and, and also um, looking at 
very important um, sort of recovery issues uh, and, and social protection systems to, to support people through it and, and, and beyond. So we're really trying to coordinate everything um, together uh, internationally. So my uh, team, the disability inclusion team in DFID, um, is so far has been gathering evidence on the impact of the pandemic on people with disabilities and producing guidance to make it as clear as possible how, um, how programs and policy can respond. And it's very clear that the pandemic will hit people with dis disabilities um, very hard. And there's three reasons for that, just briefly. It's because they are more likely to contract COVID-19 because of lack of access to public health messages and prevention measures. And, and also because the all important um, water and sanitation and hygiene facilities are not always accessible. And then also social distancing is, is unfeasible for people who rely on carers. And of course, we also hear about um, people in institutions being particularly hard hit. And so uh, people with disabilities are more likely to contract COVID-19, but then when they get it, they are also more likely to develop serious illness and die as well. So, um, and that's because of um, some underlying health conditions and, and also because a lot of people with disabilities are older people. Um, and then finally, because many people with disabilities are, are already very marginalized, they'll be severely affected by the secondary impact. So they have lower access to health care. Um, there's a disproportionate impact on, on their livelihoods, um, exacerbated barriers to social protection, issues of violence, abuse and, and neglect, um, and generally being left behind. So uh, just finally, um, the, the kind of solutions that we are advising, I mean, that I'll, I'll just run through a few, but there are many, but um, the most important one I think is to involve people with disabilities and their representative organizations meaningfully in the response, where possible putting them in leadership positions because they are the only ones that understand the barriers uh, that people with disabilities face and how to overcome them. Secondly, making uh, communications accessible um, to all types of disabilities, so hearing impairments, visual impairments, um, intellectual impairments. So um, that's really, really critical and, and we know that often people with disabilities are very much affected because they, they don't get the, those all important um, communications. And then of course, making our facilities accessible and, and disaggregating data so that we have better understanding of how um, these pandemics affect people with disabilities. So just, quick, just a quick run through the kind of things that we as a team are thinking about and, and, and advising and, and um, trying to encourage the rest of our, our organization to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Penny. That's a, a, an interesting set of initiatives. Um, I'm now going to, to move uh, to the World Bank, if I may, and invite Charlotte mclean uh to give us a, an update. Charlotte is the Global Disability Advisor for the World Bank Group, um, and her work focuses on disability-inclusive development. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you very much, Anne, and greetings to everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the HBTP for, for pulling together this webinar. Um, and what I thought I would do is, you know, give you an, some, some background around what we do more broadly in terms of including persons with disabilities and in inclusive transport, but start off with a, with a sharp focus on our response to the COVID-19 for persons with disabilities. Um, and so as Penny indicated, we know that public transport systems can reduce or in some instances actually stop services. Um, which means that persons with disabilities who rely on these methods um, may not be able to, to access those services and, and put them in further danger. Um, if it's it may be related to not able to access critical medical appointments or basic necessities or not, not have transport that enables their carers to get to them. So I think it's, it's very fair to say that transport in, is very much about responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think the other message that is important in, related, in, in relation to COVID-19 and persons with disabilities um, is that, you know, we're hearing rapid changing guidance 
um, around uh, COVID-19, and that has an impact in terms of travel restrictions. And having messages that are consistent for persons with disabilities is going to be very important. We need to be, we need to be able to ensure that messaging around transportation enables people to get to their homes, to, to be in places that are accessible to them. Um, and that is particularly a concern if you're talking about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So what we've done, what my team has done at the bank is to pull together a, an issues paper on persons with disabilities in the COVID-19 response. And within that, we look at a number of sectors, including the sector of uh, tra um, transportation and travel. Uh, this issues paper has been circulated widely and in in inside of the bank, and it's been used to influence the design of a range of new instruments um, that are being put in place to address the COVID-19 responses. And so we're beginning to see quite a lot of pickup from teams um, around uh, disability inclusion in their projects. And, and so, so this is, you know, this is good. Uh, clearly, um, there's a lot of scope for more. But I think what, what we should also be thinking about is what will the post-COVID-19 world look like for transport and in particular persons with disabilities? We know that, you know, in normal times, so to speak, that persons with disabilities experience significant transport disadvantage. Um, and that and that those those disadvantages often um, relate to further social exclusion and social exclusion that that keeps people out of the out of economic activities and um, disabled per people from from working and being part of uh, contributing um, citizens. So I think it's important for us to to really start thinking about what what will what will the world look like post COVID in relation to transport, and if this is an opportunity for re, for us to really reset this agenda and seriously think about um, disability inclusion. So I think one of the one of the approaches that we've taken at the bank is to continue to build on our analytics. Uh, to make sure that we have the evidence in place to to support this 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 pivot, hopefully, um, and what, in that regard, we are you know picking up on some analytical pieces that we've done previously. Uh, one is a, a piece that we did in the the Pacific region on infrastructure, and it sets out some practices um, that that address uh, disability that address improving accessibility for persons with disabilities and transportation. And so we're using these type of notes uh, to really share them more widely within the bank and, and really impress upon colleagues to, to, to use them in the, in the design of their projects. I think it's also important to just uh, mention that two years ago almost at the Global Disability Summit, the World Bank made 10, com 10 commitments uh, and one of these commitments was specific to, to transport. And that commitment was a commitment that requires that all new urban mobility and rail projects supporting public transportation services will be disability inclusive by 2025. And that there's a very keen commitment to incorporate key universal uh, design features uh, into, into these projects. And so we're looking and working very closely with the transport GP to ensure that this happens. Um, they keep us informed and uh, report out on advancements made in this regard. And just to say that there are three points that came up in the last meeting that I convened on, on the advancement of this commitment. One was that they have a project where they're ensuring the equity considerations um, and this is part of the Sustainable Mobility for All initiative. Uh, persons with disabilities have been well um, weaved into that initiative. Another important facility is the Global Road Safety Facility, and that too has taken, um, taken into account uh, issues related to persons with disabilities. Um, and then finally, with some new funding from DFID, um, there's been a commitment to support specific research on um, 
on 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 disability as related as as they result from uh, road crashes. So I think you know the bank is committed to ensuring that this commitment is met, and we are continuing to promote policies and practices to a improve road safety, but also very importantly to look at disability inclusive um, road and pedestrian environments. Again, I want to stress that I think that the COVID-19, the post-COVID-19 world is an opportunity for us to really think about embedding this in all of our projects. Um, I think we also recognize that there, are, there still remain a substantial number of barriers in current transportation systems. And so this needs to be considered when we look at additional financing. Are there any ways to retrofit that? And as Penny indicated, one of the points that we're really um, insisting on is close involvement of the users, and in this case, it would be persons with disabilities. We're also getting a lot of requests from transport and from other groups within the bank to assist in the development of standards and protocols. And so this is something that we will be thinking about going forward. How do we operationalize the universal access um, standards and ensure that these are mainstream throughout the transportation system. Um, and then finally, I think my brief is to continue to build the evidence base, continue to influence within the bank, uh, monitor the various commitments, and um, work towards ensuring that um, World Bank transport projects are inclusive and accessible to persons with disabilities. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. There's some very interesting uh, ideas there. And I think encouraging that we're looking on the, uh, the, the post-COVID world as an opportunity uh, as well as a challenge. We're going to move now into some global snapshots around the world. Just before I do that, we're going to go through all the, the, the presentations before we open for discussion. But remember that you can at any time start to put your uh, questions into the chat box, which should be up on your screen, or you should have a little speech bubble at the bottom of the screen that if you click on will open up the chat box. There is also uh, a raise hand function, a bit like being back at school. So um, if you see on your screen a, a raise hand function, that will indicate uh, to Louise and myself that you want to ask a question. But I would suggest that you start jotting down your questions uh, on the chat so that we're ready to roll when we get to that stage. So we're moving now into a series of, of brief snapshots from around the world uh, from some of our uh, key contributors to the Inclusive uh, Access Network. And our first one, I hope is now with us, uh, Subhash uh, Bashis from, the, from India. He's the director of the Svayam Global Center for Inclusive Environments, uh, which is doing some fabulous work, not just in India, but worldwide on highlighting accessibility issues. So let me hand over right away to uh, Subhash to talk about what is happening in India. Subhash. Thank you so much, uh, Anne, and to HVT for organizing this. This is very timely. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, you are. You're fine. Well, okay. Okay. Yeah. Clear. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the COVID response uh, in India is, is, is very organized and you'll see, you saw very early lockdown started in March itself. I mean, 24th, 25th March, we had lockdown, which continues till 3rd of May. So the entire transport and all metro, rail, edge, everything is locked down. So literally everybody is locked up in their homes and, uh, and so are disabled, disabled people and the elderly people. However, there's a very uh, well-organized uh, state response uh, to, the, to meet the needs of people with disabilities and the older, older adults. Uh, this is organized uh, at state level. You have a uh, you know, state uh, level officer, and then you have a district level officers, district nodal officers, who are coordinating with the government machinery and they're coordinating with the, the industry, the NGOs and the government uh, systems to ensure that people are receiving the essentials. 
So all our of you know the necessary the grocery uh, and medicine shops are open. Nece all necessities essentials are open, but public transport is completely closed. So uh, in such a situation, yes, we have uh, issues of people being directed to hospitals where certain hospitals are only for uh, COVID-related activities. So in, for example, if I talk of Delhi, five major government hospitals are uh, allotted only for COVID-related response. So that means they're not welcoming any other patient into that hospital. And for all other uh, you know, medical situations, the other hospitals uh, need to be tapped. So we have uh, um, ambulances which are working. So because there is no other transport, there are no, no taxis absolutely. So this is a huge problem for people. It's, they are dependent only on the ambulances. Rest for all other things, there is a very uh, coordinated effort. People are receiving rations, people are receiving their necessities and people who are in transit, especially disabled people who got stuck uh, you know, in transit or into different cities are staying in the quarantine centers or in the shelters which are created into schools. So in most of the spaces now things have stabilized. It's almost more than a month now. And the, the district administration is pretty uh, active to and is actively working with the NGOs and the disabled people organizations. And there are, we are very active on the WhatsApp groups and also there are helplines that are provided for people to approach health emergencies and for fee, you know, food and any, any other emergencies. So WhatsApp group of NGOs plus the state disability commissioner and the state nodal authorities, they're working so they're responding to the needs. So that, from that perspective, most of the needs are uh, met. But when it comes to infrastructure, we have issues. Uh, for example, because of this mask, deaf people have huge issues, but there's some NGOs are coming up with more information in form of sign language, you know, small, small uh, messages that they're circulating on these groups. Uh, similarly, for, for uh, people with other uh, disabilities, yes, we have issues because of most of these things are rooted through web. So for example, if you need ration, it has to, you have to book an online coupon. Similarly, for health, there is a telehealth system that has been uh, initiated. But for people who, are, who do not have access to a smartphone or a phone, we have problems there. So in such cases, we're connecting these people to the nearest NGO and to, to the nearest social resource center, and we are trying to manage it. Transport right now is completely closed, so therefore I do not have much uh, update on the transport, but we're looking at COVID as an opportunity uh, you know, to prepare our response uh, for, for, because we feel this is not the first and these kind of situations prepare you for the future. And we need to look at how to make this more inclusive uh, in terms of these kind of, these kind of disaster responses. Okay, thank you very much, Subhash. Although I said, um we would take questions uh, afterwards. We have a, a, a very specific question for you, Subhash, which perhaps you can pick up. It's just Bernard saying that if all public transport is shut, how do essential workers such as health workers get to work? I don't can I answer it right away or should I answer what? towards the end? No, why not answer it right away? I think as it's a specific one. Oh, great. Uh, for essential services, 25% uh, of uh, transport buses are running, which are only meant for police, which are only meant for uh, the medical uh, you know, staff, the, the nurses and the paramedics. So 25% of buses are only running, which are not open to any general citizen. It's only for emergency services. So that's on. Okay, thank you. I, I can see that your comments have uh, raised some other questions too, which we'll pick up later on. But for the sure. moment, thank you very much, Subhash. That was brilliant. Um, and I'm going to move now uh, to Pakistan and invite uh, Amin Amir Andani from the network organization working with people with disabilities in Pakistan to give us an update of the work of his organization and a, a general overview, very briefly, of what's happening uh, in Pakistan at the moment. Over to you, Amin. Perfect. So I would start with a very usual question. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. 
Perfect, perfect. So my name is Amin Amir Andani. I'm from Now PDP Pakistan. It's a disability inclusion initiative working in the areas of education and economic empowerment. We also run a fleet of hand control rickshaws by people with disabilities. And uh, till date, there are around 10,500 reported cases of COVID-19 in Pakistan. 220 deaths are reported, 2,300 recoveries, and the death to cases rate is around 2%. And almost all the transportation, including airline, railways, intercity buses, ride hailing services like Uber and Kareem are non-operational. Very few transport services are operational, like private cars, you know, transportation for groceries, medicine, and very few rickshaws are you know, visible and real. Persons with disabilities specifically are facing immense challenges here, specifically for, you know, for their usual medical needs, for physiotherapy. You know, since banks and telecom uh, industry is open, so people working in those industries, people with disabilities are challenging, are facing challenges. And recently, government has given NOC to a few companies, specifically textile companies, to open up their businesses. And many uh, individuals which we have placed in the textile sector are people with disabilities. Since these companies are open, but uh, uh, transport is not open, so they are facing challenges. Uh, the government has initiated a program for the welfare of general public. The most uh, visible program is called a SARS emergency cash program, uh, which is 12,000 Pakistani rupees for 12 million families. So this uh, thing includes persons with disabilities as well. A lot of people with disabilities in Pakistan, you know, they make a uh, special uh, national identity card are given to them, which is, you know, they have different facilities attached to that. So they are being given those uh, cash uh, available as well. Uh, since there is an issue of transportation, so they have made this cash service available through different mobile shops around the country. So people with disabilities can get, if they are eligible for that welfare thing, so they can get cash from nearby mobile shops. Many NGOs like ours has initiated door-to-door -door ration campaigns uh, and specifically uh, ride hailing services which are uh, which have a fleet of motorcycles as well they are helping us out in the distribution of ration the food packages to different individuals and uh, we are also doing that through uh, different uh, partners and uh, they have made up the government has made an application which is called sin relief application in which People with disabilities and anyone who is getting Russian are like required by organizations to enter their red data. Uh, so there is no duplication of Russian and food stuff. Since people with disabilities are facing issues in getting medical services, so there are a few organizations which has initiated uh, telehealth services. Most prominent one is Seth Kahani, which is also a partner for partner of ours. They have offered free. Uh, trans the free consultancy, medical consultancy for people with disabilities. And our organization in general, we have taken responsibility of 3,500 families across Pakistan for the next three months. And the support includes Russian skills and livelihoods. And since our organization provides training, skills training to people with disabilities, so all the trainings that we used to have is now converted into online. So, and one interesting thing that uh, we, are, we, are being, we, are, we are noticing in this online training stuff is that we are observing, you know, less absenteeism uh, amongst uh, uh, people with disabilities. So the attendance is better in comparison. So maybe it's due to the factor that generally in Pakistan, people face, people with disabilities face challenges and new community community. So in the last, I would like to mention that the biggest question, the biggest dilemma for everyone here is how to balance between uh, the idea of social distancing and hunger. Because many persons with disabilities and many people with disabilities, it, many people in general in Pakistan are poor. So how long this is going to continue, there is a frustration amongst everyone. 
and people are like very desperate and there are voices among people that it's better to die of uh, covid-19 to you know die of other than rather than high, die, dying of uh, hunger so there is this dilemma in front of government and we hope something better will come out thank you very much thank you very much i mean for that very clear picture of what's happening in in Pakistan and congratulations on the work that your organization is doing um, i think you've thrown up some very interesting challenges there we're moving now to south africa and i'm delighted to welcome amanda gibbard uh, amanda is director of universal design and universal access at the department of transport in south africa over to you amanda thank you very much Anne. um again i'd just like to check you can hear me and I've worked out how to use the unmute button. Yep, you're loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and greetings to everyone from South Africa. Um, we have, uh, a you know, covering the same sorts of issues and it's um, very helpful to be coming at the same time as, as, as India and, and Pakistan because um, this issue of, of Poverty and economic concerns um, and access to food is is one that's very prevalent here. And I'd also like to add that, you know, maybe it's also because the people who are really, really suffering can't afford to travel. And so for here as well, it's particularly international travel, there's been a lot of anger that this this disease has been brought in by other people and it isn't of a concern for for local people and, and a sort of anger about that that uh, means it's 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 quite difficult to to deal with and also overcrowded townships which make social distancing impossible and um lack of access to water you know so you you know if you're talking about hand washing you know how on earth are you going to expect people to do that and those sorts of things meant that it just seemed very sensible to have a national lockdown pretty much at the same time certainly as India um, to try and get on top of those situations um, and do something about them um, before before the pandemic really hit the country so we introduced um, a national lockdown at the same time as um, as local transmission happened and that's been really successful um, although now everybody's getting a bit sick of it and um, and it is clear that that cases are not under control um, there are sort of local breaches and, and national transmission um, and that we're just trying to deal with that so what's happened is we do have um, restriction of non-essential travel um, people can travel to uh, for doctor's appointments or to pick up medicine or prescription um, and they, if they can, because transport's not brilliantly accessible, um, but there's a lot of work um, between government departments to try and deal with that and to get um, both, you know, provisions and, and medicine and, and other sort of health hygiene provisions that people need to them rather than them having to travel. So there is that support for people with disabilities and because there's such a, a large network of people on cell phones um a lot is happening through whatsapp i mean it, it's and you're certain if you have a disability you can set your own network up of support which is i think is a really good thing in a lockdown which i think in terms of other countries is fairly hard which is what we have here one of the things that we're seeing is that for people with learning disabilities um there are cases of people with autism who are really, really struggling. There's one case of, of a mum who's got three autistic children and she's a, an essential worker and has found it really hard. But again, because we're working across government, we've been able to link up with the Department of Health where she lives and, and something can be done about it. So there's case by case issues being sorted out. I'm sure it's not all of them, but you know we are, we are doing that. And in terms of the financial situation, you know, the government's looking at, um, we're looking at particular packages to start stimulating the economy uh, where we can whilst trying not to let things get out of hand. So those are sort of important balancing acts and it's quite important for us that um, nationally this has been a, a state of disaster because there's quite a lot of 
work that's been done on a disaster response, which is analyzing from a risk assessment perspective, you know, what the, the likelihood is of an of a, of a adverse risk and also the consequences of that. So whatever they are trying to balance the health and the economic aspects. And one of the things that's been done is that, you know, there are social grants here. So to sort out the social grants for elderly people and people with disabilities separate from the other grants, and also to increase the amount of money that's going to particularly poor people. And just in terms of transport, um, we've, we've really tried to learn from the experience of other countries. And I think this is where um, some, some international guidelines would be really appreciated. The situation, for example, on masks has been quite confusing. I mean, as far as I can read and learn, there's no question that masks should be worn on public transport because people can't always control the social distancing. So it's not to try and take away the need for social distancing, but if you are on public transport, it's really difficult to, um, to control that the whole time. And I've just made a few notes about that in the, the group chat that are questions from me really. So I think that's that's really our approach. I think from a South African perspective, this really throws up problems with city planning. Um, apartheid cities are great for social distancing because everybody's really far away. But if you have to get transport to get to link up and to get to services, you are stuck if you want to walk because as an alternative, you can't. And I think the need for you know good standards is important um, but it's also to get universal design into planning and make it um, a, a, a necessary aspect of, of funding for that it would would help enormously we've worked hard on a new minibus taxi design which is in quite late stages a lot of the transport here is by minibus taxi and um, i'd like to talk a, a little bit about that later if I, if i can but I think those are the main points um, from the lockdown that's happened in South Africa, Anne. Thank you, Over to Thank you. you I don't know if I've used up my five minutes, but I thought I should stop there. No, absolutely. That's, that's great. And there will be opportunity to come back for discussion shortly. So that's been a really helpful uh, snapshot of, of what's happening where you are. We're now going to leap across the world uh, to Janet Jimenez Santos, who is in Mexico. Janet is a consultant uh, focused on access for people with disabilities, and she does a lot in the uh, built environment in particular. So Janet, welcome, let's hear from you. So hello everybody, uh, hope you are all safe and full of energy today. So I will focus on the solutions implemented in Mexico City and its metropolitan area, which is the state of Mexico for public transport. But I, I wanted to start saying which is the main issue in general. So due to a number of reasons, Mexican citizens distrust their government. So regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, some think it is a fraud, while others, others are afraid. So the basic things uh, for uh, what transportation authorities has done is information information has been a key factor in this pandemic. Transport authorities have been creative in giving information for people with different levels of education, that is with drawings, comics, alien character, characters, etc. And considering the cultural aspects, I mean, they have been really thinking and trying to make sure that the right message is sent. So they have been careful not to panic the citizens but at the same time, we need citizens to understand what is happening and, there, and therefore make it easier that people will follow actions, that this is not something that it's uh, imposed and control anger, as right now Amanda mentioned. I think this is uh, one ver the first issue that we have to address. So information has been given in different formats, uh, visual, audio, videos. Now it is compulsory for all audio information regarding the pandemic to include an interpreter of uh, Mexican sign language. So while explaining what the pandemic is about, gradual actions have been taken for the public transport by implementing tighter measures one step at a time. So uh, communication between local authorities have been a key thing Right now, all transport systems in Mexico City 
the underground, the BRT, the light railway, and its metropolitan area, including especially the BRT, are in constant communication with each other to make sure that they are giving exactly the same information and at the same time to the passengers. So both authorities implement the same strategies. And I think this has been uh, uh, very successful. So what they have done now, it's you know, as they're doing it step by step, which is the strategy that they have used to reduce mobility gradually. So first of all, not to use public force to implement actions. No, I mean, they have not used the army as in other uh, countries, you know, to, and, and not, they have been trying not to have extreme actions. I don't know if this is right or wrong, but which are the other strategies to reduce mobility in different systems? So for some metro stations that are not critical, they have closed them temporarily. The BRT buses have reduced 50% of their passengers' capacity so that people can keep uh, in a safe distance with each other. And also uh, they have put more staff in the uh, station platforms. So uh, they control more how many people go inside the buses. And they have put tapes you know, to, uh, over some seats to avoid seating. So this is a, an action that has done. But another one is that we have a program you know, where all private vehicles must adhere to an existing anti-pollution program to keep them off the streets once a week. So they're using the program you know, for anti-pollution that we have had for over five years. And now they're using this program you know, to control you know, uh, that uh, private vehicles you know, are not in the street and under these uh, circumstances. So which are the needs identified for policy changes? So the first one, local authorities and municipalities you know, must, uh, including their programs, a coordination between them and with the different stakeholders. Now that we know that per trip, the costs are adding, you know, we need to subsidize from the government. So actually today, uh, there will be a meeting with negotiations with the providers of the services, you know, how can we, um, all these adding costs you know, that these uh, transport systems are having, you know, how, are, how are they going you know, to, to sort it out? Uh, we also need regulations for maintenance and building work of the transport system during this contingency. I mean, right now they're working at night, but, um, no, but we, know, we need to know more about this. We know to uh, also have regulations for sanitary measures in public transport for the future, which we didn't have, we don't have right now. The protection of the bus drivers. I mean, we're, right now we know that they're having a plastic screen in their cabin, gloves and face ma masks, but also operational aspects. And of course the planning, because we have to be resilient, right? So. Uh, how are we going to plan this? And I think Amanda mentioned a little bit about this. Uh, the equipment and access to internet to hold virtual meetings, this is something that the government is having a hard time. Uh, they don't have computers, you know, to work in their house and they don't have good access to the internet. So this has been quite an issue. Uh, the disposable items, all these gloves, the face masks, masks, what are they doing with all this trash? You know, which are the regulations? Because now they're accumulating, you know, especially in the pure, poor areas, all these uh, gloves and all these things. But how are they going to process uh, this trash? I think also we will need to regulation for this. Uh, also, uh, use electronic signatures for handling official paperwork remotely. Uh, we will have to look more in the future about government uh, email servers. Servers, you know, they, right now they're not working properly. So officials uh, resort to using private emails addresses. And of, co of course, all the communications uh, have been in personal uh, 
phone numbers, you know, having a cost for the staff. And just to finish, uh, I would like to talk about the private transport services. Right now, the ramp vehicles have been very successful. I know that they are private, but we still know that people with disabilities, they have health services needs constantly, for example, dialysis, uh, medical appointments that right now Charlotte uh, mentioned, but the, the government has not looked at it. So right now we are relying on the private sector. And of course it has a cost. So that's why, uh, again, you know, uh, and I think right now, as Charlotte mentioned, and I put this, uh, uh, actually this meeting today was going to be about the international standards for accessibility for different types of vehicles. I think that we should really be looking at this, at the international standards for this, because we will need more, you know, to uh, persons with disabilities need to move and also to look at the standards for the protocols, you know, for, for the post COVID-19. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, <clears throat> Janet. Again, a very interesting perspective. A lot of common themes around the world, but also some, some very different approaches and different uh, key points. Our last uh, global stop um, is in the USA. Uh, Mohammed Youssef uh, is Program Manager for the Accessible Transportation Technology Research Initiative at Federal Highways. But Mohammed today is not going to talk about what's happening in the USA, possibly just as well. He's going to be talking about his work for the Equally Able Foundation, uh, which he has founded and which he runs. So, Mohammed, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Um, uh, in this uh, very uncertain times, uh, we were surprised with the number of requests uh, we were uh, receiving uh, from uh, different places. And most of that had to do with two key things. Uh, one, um, the food and hunger and the shortage of that uh, for individuals and families with disabilities. The other requests were mostly from people who have had some jobs, but are able or not able to go to those or those jobs doesn't exist. So we, um, created a, a, a program just to focus on uh, the COVID disability relief. And in the last um, uh, two to three weeks, um, we have uh, um, approved uh, certain projects, uh, including uh, supporting uh, uh, 6,000 individuals uh, with uh, uh, food supplies for a month. Uh, in um, in uh, um, outside of the uh, U.S., uh, we also had wanted to do something in the United States, and initially we looked to see if we could partner with some big uh, um, organizations or uh, supply chains, and that really didn't work. But uh, a week ago, we have signed a memorandum of understanding with Easter Seals, uh, which has this uh, very ambitious plan to help over a million uh, people with disabilities, uh, veterans and families. And uh, we have made a grant uh, to uh, Easter Seals. Um, we feel that we will have more requests uh, um, uh, to um, review and approve as the um, days go by. A lot of our funding and the efforts to raise funds uh, are uh, devoted to COVID-related uh, um, uh, initiative. Uh, in the few minutes that I have, uh, what I am hoping that uh, in terms of um, the way forward uh, is to be able to gather data and um, not only uh, look at the lessons learned, um, but you could use some new technology tools to analyze. And I'm hoping that maybe there could be some artificial intelligence models 
look to see how uh, a situation like this you know, could be avoided. Uh, we have seen something similar, not to the same level, but um, the earthquake in uh, Japan led to different um, lapses in emergency management. So the couple of thoughts I have is that the new technology or a way forward thinking uh, could help with not only the um, communication and the accessible um, communication piece from using, um, as others have mentioned on WhatsApp or uh, a smartphone technology, um, there is a need to have a purpose-built transport model um, to create algorithms. You know, I have known of my colleagues and friends in the U.S. Uh, who were exposed to others who have had uh, COVID, and um, are, it is unfortunate, but they had to go through um, the whole COVID situation. You know. um, and then um, the 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 cognitive side, uh, people with uh, autism, Down syndrome. You know, again, uh, if there are different models, you know, that could be looked at. With that, I'm going to pause. Uh, but I know if you know of, uh, I'm going to uh, end with this request. If uh, there are other um, groups uh, in other parts of the world who are in need of funding, we don't have a large amount, but uh, still. Uh, it'd be good to look at um, any uh, acute needs and see if equally able can do anything with that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mohammed. And uh, that's a, a, a very uh, generous offer there at the end for uh, anyone who thinks that there are programs that equally able could help with uh, to contact Mohammed. Right, let's, uh, let's now move to an open discussion. Um, as you can see on the screen, you're being asked, if you would, to put your questions in the chat box. Um, I'd like, if we can, both to pick up any questions that arise from the contributions we've heard, but also to focus on what information are we lacking? Uh, in particular, what can we do to support low-income countries in reducing the impact of the infection? And what can we do to support particularly the needs of people with disabilities? Um, I don't know while we're waiting for people to uh, start typing, um, perhaps we can pick up um, Amanda's question, which was about the lack of apparent lack of research currently on the role of transport in actually spreading the infection. Amanda, do you want briefly to pick that up and then let's see who might come in and, and comment on it? Um, thank you, Anne. Yes, it's, it's, I, I'm not quite sure who I'm directing it to, but I just think that it's, it's an area of concern for this particular group. Um, you know, I, I think early on, you know, as things were unfolding before we were in a lockdown, but knew we were going there, I was busy trying to pull something together. And the Shenzhen bus experience was a really useful um, webinar to, to get access to how we would write transport guidelines, which we're now currently doing. But it raised a concern for me because, you know, pandemics tra travel with, with transport. And obviously this one was with, with, with international travel. And then, you know, it, it just seemed to me to be very clear that the level of infection and the rapid spreading of, the, of COVID-19 was way beyond anything that seemed to be given in, in terms of, of advice. And that it wasn't just being spread by transport, but actually maybe people were positive and didn't know and were spreading it and didn't have any symptoms. And, and that would explain the rapid proliferation of the virus, which was then beyond the control of individuals' own immune systems and, and obviously the health system too. And, and I, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm using Google Scholar, which probably most people are, but looking at specific cases, I mean, obviously the, you know, the cruise ships are a particular interest, but it's just, you know, how do you then translate that into firm guidelines of what you should do with a public transport system to try and limit the spread? Or, you know, one of the things I've been putting forward is that we should be testing at stations and and, and particularly minibus taxi ranks because everybody uses minibus taxis here and they're still being used to for essential services and essential transport. 
So I'm trying to come up with some, you know, clear guidelines that we can then use um, as well as the mask issue. And, and I think it would be really helpful. We're being very strict on social distancing and things like that as well. But it's just, you know, those other, other issues and the, the issue of asymptomatic people who are positive and don't know it. And how long is the incubation period really? It's those sorts of questions I'd like to be able to find more out. And I'm, I'm looking for research because it, it has such a major impact on our health systems and we're not necessarily able to deal with it as well as the economic issues. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that. I don't know if anyone uh, would like to come in directly. I don't know whether Nick Tyler is uh, with us because I know that he's doing some research into these issues. Are you there, Nick? No, perhaps not. Okay. Um, hey, Anne, uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'd be glad to give a report. I understood you wanted me to give one. This is Tom Rickert. Tom, yes, please. Okay, uh, I'll say a couple words here. Uh, I'm Tom Rickert with Access Exchange International in San Francisco. And we have had a special uh, initial interest in the need for quickly uh, planning emergency transportation for persons with disabilities who are left without access to critical health concerns. Uh, thinking of kidney dialysis, for example, or getting an oxygen tank refilled in their homes. And uh, this occurs when their current services are cut or, or cut entirely or are reduced and uh, people are thrown into an immediate but almost life-threatening life situation. So we've met this need by publishing a flyer, or very partially met it, that's all we've done. It's uh, on the subject of suggestions for advocates and for transport personnel during the current pandemic. And uh, thanks a lot to you, Jeanette, and to Subash and Ananda for Amanda for your help. And the flyer has been sent in English and Spanish to, as an email attachment to uh, around uh, 1,400 contacts in 70 countries. It's now posted on, in English and Spanish on our website, also on the website of Libre Acceso in Mexico City. And uh, it just feels to me like we need to rather quickly uh, get practical advice out here. And one suggestion I have is to include more transit operators in our work. Uh, this could be helpful and one helpful place to go is the transport knowledge platform at, uh, what is it, www. Uh, trans, uh, I have it down here, yes, transformative mobility org. And uh, it's, it's really for the operators and it's very, very helpful. And uh, uh, we need to work with people who are left without access and uh, we need to work like more with ITDP, for example, with Russ Ross Center, uh, and then even more than that with hands-on people who have experience with disability in, in the major transit uh, systems, I think in London, New York, San Francisco, and so forth. There's just a lot of talent out there. And uh, it could be we're not involving these people very much yet. So I hope we can. Anyway, those are some of my thoughts. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm delighted you've been able to, to join us. And as always, congratulations on, on what you're doing. And I think pointing a very clear practical focus there. Um, I've just had a note that not everybody can see the chat box and is not therefore able to put their questions in. So um, at the risk of chaos, if anyone out there uh, isn't able to uh, jump in, do you want to speak and we'll try and uh, control the discussion? So an open call to anyone who's not able to put a question on the chat box. Um, and I just want to uh, start with a question uh, which Jeff um, Turner has um, mentioned uh, for everybody, um, that HVT is trying to develop an open access archive of the range of information reports and guidance that's been produced by various organizations um, that is um, of relevance and of use for the transport sector across low income um, countries in Africa and Asia. And um, he's asking if people have mentioned any particular reports or material today, if he could um, be made aware of that by um, sending a link, uh, perhaps, and um, that could be sent either to me or to the um, HVT info at IMC Worldwide dot com um, address and I can forward that on to um, on to Jeff. 
Um, Jeff, you also raised a, a, another question about the role for civil society. Um, do you want me? Do you want to uh, come in and, and chat about that? Uh, yes, uh, Anne and Louise, if I may. Uh, I just was um, interested from the the range of presentations that were highlighting the important role that. Uh, community groups, civil society, civil society organizations and uh, disabled people's organizations were playing in facilitating uh, um, the experience of lockdown, as it were, for a range of uh, uh, um, people with disabilities, other vulnerable groups, uh, and low income communities. And, and this is a, you know, in terms of you know, facilitating identifying need, facilitating uh, you know, uh, delivery of uh, supplies, uh, medical food, whatever, facilitating even transportation. The transport sector has, in low-income countries particularly, tends not to have very much experience of being able to actively deal and engage with uh, civil society uh, organisations. Uh, and, uh, um, and I just really raise the question of whether, going forward, this was a new... Uh, a skill a skill set a need for uh, knowledge and uh, skills within the sector so that you know uh, um, in the recovery phase this uh, involvement and reliance cross sectorally across the uh, uh, civil society can actually then feed back into the works of the transport sector thank you for that jeff um, hi and this is charlotte can i say hi, something yes of course um, so just to pick up on the, the points around uh, community engagement and um, the voice of persons with disabilities, I think that this is something that we really need to think about because um, certainly from the perspective of the bank, uh, many of the in-country consultations that we had were often face-to-face. -face. Those obviously have stopped in, you know, given the COVID-19 situation. Um, and so many of those consultations or all of those consul consultations are pivoting to to online, um, which is which is understandable, uh, but we also know that persons with disabilities are often um, the poorest in the community. May very often don't have access uh, to internet or to a laptop, um, and so that we run the risk of further marginalization uh, because of this in terms of consultations. And so, I would be interested in hearing from colleagues if they have any ideas on how we might um, you know, be a bit, more, um, a, a, a bit more considerate of groups that are typically excluded, but perhaps are even further excluded now given COVID-19. I think you know, the use of uh, cell phones is good, but you know, cell phone coverage is, is not, is, it doesn't penetrate all countries. And so we need to think about other alternatives to communicating, um, you know, we've been talking about really going back to uh, snail mail, you know, you can use radio, but radio may not reach deaf people. And so we have to think about uh, packages, I think, uh, to address issues around consultations, how people engage, and, and similarly, how people communicate and how we work towards uh, changing people's behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That's a very key question. I don't know if anyone uh, taking part has any views on that or has any experience of, of good ideas that have come forward. Uh, please jump in if you do. Hi there. Yeah. Um, this is Crystal. I'm um, from Nairobi, Kenya. I am a consultant. I'm a disabilities consultant mm -hmm. and um, I work with an NGO at the moment called Open Institute, and I lead a program which um, is called Ability. So I joined the call because I'm interested and I work with um, accessible transportation and just uh, the built environment as well, collecting data around Nairobi and around different cities in Kenya. And this question has just been posed um, by Charlotte. Um, first of all, I actually should say that I'm a visually impaired person myself, so I am disabled. And I think this idea that people with disabilities don't have access um, um, as a generalization maybe is what might be holding us back from trying things because in my experience um, as, a, as an ambassador of people with visual impairment and also as just a voice in, this, in the disabled community that um, people dis disabled listen to, I feel that I usually get a lot of interaction from 
uh, PWDs themselves when I do a call, whether it's through video, whether it's through WhatsApp, emails, etc. Last week I did a webinar and we had about 70 people, 70 people with disabilities join the webinar across all types of disabilities in Kenya. And um, the, it was a very rich conversation and there was a lot of things that were, um, were put across as issues and uh, solutions and, and requests and ideas. So maybe if we, if we can just think, okay, maybe the majority or those in rural areas cannot have access to internet or smartphones, that's fine. But what about those who are able? Because word of mouth is a massive thing in the disabled community. So if I, as a visually impaired person, can jump on a call, for sure, when the call is done, I will go into my WhatsApp groups where there are 70, 100, 150 other visually impaired persons, and I will share that information. And that's, and that's how we get to, um, to communicate. Number two is an idea that um, maybe we can, we can consider is using USSD codes. Because in Kenya, for sure, I'm not sh I can't speak about other African or Asian countries, but in Kenya, for sure, lots of people have access to mobile phones a lot, even the most rural of areas and the most sort of, of um, far flung parts of the country. And so instead of um, relying only on internet, there are USSD codes where you can communicate with PWDs on all kinds of issues and have them respond to you, you know, like dial star one, one, one hash and answer the question, number one, number two, number three, number four, because they don't need internet for that. They just need a phone. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it has internet or not. So that might be um, something that we can explore as well. Thank you very much. That's the extremely interesting perspective there. Can I, I say something? I'm sorry? Can I add something? Yes, please. Yes, so I would agree to what Crystal just said there because we know I have already mentioned we run training programs, skills training program for people with disabilities in Pakistan. So what we have recently observed is after this COVID-19 situation, we have converted all of the training programs to online and we're seeing better attendance because usual in usual cases, it's very challenging for people with disabilities to come to a location and you know get a training so in this situation we are getting better attendance and we initiated a program recently an e-commerce program and we were able to get uh, registrations faster in usual circumstances uh, other than that so you know this situation is very interesting for us as well and we are observing it as few months pass we'll be able to you know see a sort of trend that you know this is actually somehow better for people with disabilities to get training and stuff like that in, through uh, technology. Thank you. Again, a very interesting perspective. And I think what's coming through is that there are, there are many parts of the world where access to technology, to smartphones and so on, is extremely high among people with disabilities as well as the population as a whole. But I think going back to Charlotte's point, we mustn't forget that there are still very large numbers of people who don't have that access, older people, people with disabilities, and we just need to take care that we don't exclude them from all the networks that are being established. I don't know, Charlotte, if you want to come back. Yeah, so I was just looking, I mean, I think um, there's, a, there's a factoid from the bank that 90% of the 40% of poorest households in Africa do not have a computer at home, um, and 40% of the poorest do not have mobile phones. So my point was really, um, I mean, I recognize that in urban in urban um, cities, um, there is often very you know wide penetration. Uh, but I was really thinking more about very excluded groups that stand to be further excluded. Um, and yes, I think you know word of mouth is important, but that can also have consequences in terms of messaging. Um, so I you know I would be interested in in thinking about how do we reach these communities that are hard to reach in a way that enables a meaningful, in, a meaningful participation. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that was the point that I was making. Thank you very much for that. Um, um, I, I just wondered if I could add something. Yeah. Um, there were just two points. One, one is that, you know, obviously the situation that we're in as a world is opening up opportunities for technology. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time for people with disabilities, what they've done with their phone is to make it accessible to them. 
So there's a potential for them something to become much, much easier. But just to pick up as well on the other point is that um, it's not just about having access to a phone, it's being able to afford data or to be able to, have, you know, make that connection. And I think that this is where it comes into a sort of more sort of big government thing. I know we've been trying here in South Africa to make data cheaper so that people can become more connected. Um, and there's discussions going on at levels I don't know about, about whether, you know, a certain amount of data can be made available for free. Um, and I think that's something that does need looking at by government. And I, I do think, you know, certainly in my work, I'm really trying to reach out through networks to make sure that people are connected and can link up, even if they can't directly themselves. And I think, you know, this is something we've got legislation that unfortunately hasn't been well implemented for the last 10 years, but it requires us to reach out and to go and find people. Um, and so we're trying to do that through the different departments and networks, but it would help enormously, I think, if people had better access to data um, as well so that they can. I think that the, the situation in developing countries might be slightly different to developed countries because the elderly population are perhaps more likely to have cell phones, um, but it doesn't mean to say that they have data. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Bernard has just raised an interesting Point for those of you who can see the, the chat, which is that in a post-COVID-19 world where more employers have recognised that people can work effectively from home, will this improve the employment opportunities for people with disabilities as mobility may be less of an issue? Anyone want to pick that one up? So this is Charlotte. I mean, Bernard, I th thank you for raising that. I mean, I think I've seen a lot of um, articles on that from persons with disabilities. Um, and saying that, you know, basically for, for um, many, many years, people have been asking for a reasonable accommodation, often which is to work from home. <laughs> I've been denied that um, because it has been said not to be um, ultimately um, uh, productive. And, and, and now we have basically the whole world working from home. So, I mean, I think it, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether that fundamentally changes uh, the way people work. Um, what I what I do worry about is that there that people with disabilities don't find themselves exclusively staying home and working from home because I think there's a lot to be said for social interaction um, and so I I think it should be a choice that people make um, as we gradually work towards going back to work. Um, if persons with disabilities feel more comfortable or anybody else feels more comfortable working from home, then, then that should be uh, an option. But I think it's, it's going to be an interesting um, point to follow. Absolutely. And I think you're, you're right that we don't want an assumption made that uh, you, can, you can work from home and that's an end of it because it's, uh, it's, it's not that conducive for, for many people. I, I wanted, if I may, briefly to come back to a point that Janet was making uh, about what's happening in Mexico City in terms of making sure that communication about transport and everything else is in appropriate and accessible formats. Um, I think that's something that's been lacking around the world. I know there have been lots of comments in places about, you know, government statements, there's nobody doing sign language. Um, there's nobody uh, looking at the fact that if you're wearing a face mask, anyone who needs to lip read can't communicate. Uh, a lot of people with visual impairment are finding that where there are restrictions on uh, distancing, and which side of the road you should walk, they're not aware of that and they're, they're unable to measure it. So, um, and I think, and also the point about putting stuff out in, in pictures and easy to read format and so on. There's some good stuff happening there and I don't know whether there should be more of that, whether that's being done universally. Does anyone want to pick up on, on that or on any of the other points? Uh, and can I add something? And I'm sorry I got popped off, uh, so just uh, rejoining. But this has to do more with uh, the question that Charlotte has posed. I think there is a social responsibility piece, uh, messaging uh, that could be pushed. What is unfortunate is even in the US, uh, we were um, looking into a platform to do some uh, online virtual uh, meetings. And there is a new startup uh, which really has some fascinating features. 
uh, when uh, we actually uh, were talking to them to consider, they had no idea of what accessibility or Section 508 means. And they already have had done some big uh, meetings with some corporations. Um, I think that tendency to uh, be not inclusive and design solutions, you know, is something that should be discouraged. Uh, but that's going to be a bigger policy challenge uh, to work at the government levels and at other states and local agencies to try push for changes, you know, that all access uh, is uh, as needed as any any anything else. You know, the, these groups cannot be um, neglected and not be uh, included. You know. Thank you for that. I, I think you're right. We, we are all learning so many uh, painful and difficult lessons at the moment that we must make sure that anything that can be turned into a positive is not forgotten as we all uh, look forward to emerging from the current state. So let me see, we're moving towards the point where we need to, um, to start winding up and thinking about next steps, but I'm seeing a question uh, up on the screen. Uh, is that Sue Rogers? Oh, hello, yes. Um, uh, yeah, so my question was uh, just really, I was very interested in the point around Mexico City and the idea of the pollution-based um, private ha car, car hire use um, uh, and how that's now actually quite valuable for the pandemic response. Um, I actually am a, a secondita diffid, but I'm working, um, I'm quite interested in the idea of um, how we can assure that future pandemic uh, pandemics align with perhaps climate resilience programming. So for example, should should governments look at mechanisms for disaster response to more generally cover pandemics as well as uh, things like droughts, et cetera? Uh, just interested to know the group's opinions. Okay, thank you for that. I mean, I think what's absolutely clear to all of us is that none of our governments were properly prepared for what's happened. Uh, does anyone want to pick up that specific point? Um, sorry, Anne, I'd like, I'd just like to add, you know, it's, it's along with the idea of, of, of sustainability, this issue of pollution, because I know, you know, in some of the poorest parts of the world and the some, the some most polluted parts of the world, including South Africa and, and Gauteng, you know, there's a difference in air quality. We notice it particularly in winter because of the way the weather works in winter here, which is to, to sort of pull all the air down. And so it's often more polluted and this year it's it's not being so polluted and i've seen pictures of india um in in in, in new delhi where you know i've been and 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 the air quality the look of the air quality is so totally different and i think that this is this is something and also links with disability because this is a respiratory condition and i don't think we yet know um how people are going to recover if it is if it's affected their lungs to the extent that they're permanently damaged or they're going to take a long time to recover and whether this should affect the way we design things and whether we're going to have a greater group of people with disabilities that we need to be able to respond to you know in the future after this um, and i think those are all things again that we need more research on and um and that that kind of background and then just one thing about messaging too i think is really important the the, the work that um janet's been doing in mexico i'll share a clip of a song that i've just received um on whatsapp after the meeting um but we've worked quite hard here on doing you know enough sign language um in the news so that people can get the message everyone can get the message um and yes, we're trying to work with the same things about clear messaging and, and, and straightforward um, information. Thanks. Thank you very much, Amanda. We're, we're moving towards the end of our session and I want just to take a moment or two to wrap up, but can I invite anyone on the call uh, who's got a, a burning suggestion or question to come forward with it now? Uh, 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 Anne, it's Bernard here. I just got a couple of things. I, I really do like the questions that have been raised around, you know, what is the relationship between climate resilience and the pandemic uh, resilience? Um, I think the two are very much intertwined. There's much, a lot of lessons we need to learn about our response to the pandemic um, and that, that would help us model all the 
work we've been doing in resilience and climate change resilience, they're very much intertwined. How do transport systems respond to climate change events? And we can model that against what we've learned from recent happenings. Um, another aspect which I think was raised by Amanda is relating to transport systems and the health and, the uh, and, and transport systems as, as the conduit for, for the infection that we've seen around. Is there, indeed, there isn't much work on that, and I think it's a, to me, is a gaping area that requires some investigation. Um, we've commissioned within HVT a small study just to look at that, uh, 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 an insight piece that might sort of tell us then where do we go in terms of the research in that aspect. I'd be interested to have any any input to those areas and any suggestions and, and sort of uh, how, how we go forward on that. We'll be sharing that insight piece, of course, with everyone uh, in the network. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bernard. And I think one of the one of the most valuable things that this session has done is to open up lines of communication between all of us. And I think a lot more will flow as a result of that. Um, just very briefly, the, the, the key things that for me have come out of today, um, and then I'll hand back to Louise to talk about the, the practicalities of follow up. Um, one is the issue of, of access to food and medication for people with disabilities. We've heard about a lot of initiatives going on around the world in different places. I think what we're not clear about yet is the extent to which that is actively meeting need um, or whether there are still gaps and issues that need to be picked up. And again, it seems to me there would be benefit in sharing information about the initiatives that are being taken, whether it's in, in Pakistan or in China or wherever it is, so we can, we can look at the different options because my feeling is there will be a lot of places where things are actually not happening well and that people with disabilities um, are going to be suffering in terms of um, access to food and to medication. Second big issue we've talked about is technology. Um, and clearly that's playing a hugely important role in many parts of the world as a means of keeping people in touch um, and enabling people to continue to function. And I think as Charlotte's been saying, we just need to keep aware of those who are not able to access technology and think about ways in which both now and in a, a post-COVID world, we can make sure that we're not um, disenfranchising those who don't have that kind of access. And then the, th the third one to emerge for me has been the issue of, of communication and the extent to which all of us, whether it's government or transport operators um, or, or more locally, are communicating with people with different uh, needs, whether it's people with impaired vision or hearing or intellectual uh, issues, the, the need for everybody to understand what's going on and what they can do to get what they need is vital. And I think in the, in the panic around the world to cope with this huge uh, pandemic, quite a lot of that level of communication is being lost and people are being excluded. So I think that's one that also needs picking up. I'm sure that we, there are a lot of issues that have been raised very interestingly, and I'm going to ask Louise now just to, to tell us how those have been captured and how we're going to communicate. Louise. Yes, thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to um, prepare a summary from this um, call and share that with, um, with everybody who's registered and attended today. Um, we did have some people on the call earlier from PIOC, um, and they've been um, both um, Amanda and Subesh have raised questions about protocols for public transport and um, standards for, for transport. Um, and I'm sorry that they're not on the call now and they, it would have been good to hear from them uh, about their thoughts around this. We have had an invitation from PIOC to um, perhaps host a follow on webinar from this particular one, which looks at some of the issues arising and, and opens it up for wider discussion. Um, and I think we need to take them up on that offer. And these are some of the questions that we can certainly raise to them um, and through their technical committees. Uh, so we'll definitely be looking to, to take all of these actions forward and, and share it more widely. Thank you very much, Louise. I think uh, given that we promised to keep to time, uh, we should close the session. Some of you need to get to bed, some of you need to get up, and some of you just need to get on with your day. So thank you all very much indeed for participating. I hope that everybody's found it useful. And uh, as Louise and I have both said, this will be the first uh, stage in some further communication and development. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>